Well, it's good for us to come around the uh, Word of God again today. The promises of Jesus that bring us hope in difficult times. And uh, this is number 14 in the series. Wow, where's the time gone? And uh, it's one of those special promises which I think a lot of you will have been saying, I wonder when he's going to <laughs> speak on that one. Uh, well, today's the day. And uh, that's the promise, of course, at the end of Matthew's Gospel where Jesus says, and I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So that's what we're going to look at today. But it, you see, it's been quite a journey for these intrepid disciples, hasn't it? What they thought they knew in life, well, it's been turned upside down. <laughs> in fact, it's been turned inside out as well as upside down. Peter, James, John, fishermen, who are now fishers of men. Matthew, a tax collector who was hated, abused by his family and friends, neighbors. He didn't have any friends. <laughs> now he's become a carrier of truth. He's become a, one who shares the love of God. He's one who's been used in bringing uh, healing to the sick and freedom to the captive soul. He's now a storyteller. He's the writer. He's the writer of good news. He's the writer of good news to the world. I mean, isn't it astonishing? Simon, think of Simon the Zealot. I mean, a revolutionary, uh, a one who would be who would be ready to fight with everybody and about everything. <laughs> uh, we would call him today a terrorist, and now he's a court, he's a carrier of good news. He's a peacemaker. <laughs> this has been some change, isn't it? This last year has taught us a lot. Uh, we, a lot of lessons that we needed to learn. Some classes we'd prefer not to have had to go to. <laughs> but nonetheless, we went. Well, we had no choice, did we? But we went, and now we've learned some things about ourselves. Life as we knew it has changed. And in some respects, it will never be the same again. Maybe that's a good thing. A secular society that has become accustomed to looking after number one with, without any consideration of, uh, of others, those in need, our neighbors, even our own families. Something was indeed terribly wrong. And maybe now, maybe, just maybe, maybe some things have changed for the better. But the big shock has been in regard to our own personal behavior and our own personal well-being. What we thought we knew about ourselves, well, <laughs> well, now the truth is out there, isn't it? We were either deceiving ourselves before, and we now know better, or maybe, maybe we have changed. Maybe our personalities have changed, or our mental health has deteriorated where we were once laid back and quite relaxed about everything, but now we're tense and nervous and possibly even fearful. And that's not good. Maybe you were patient before, <laughs> but the fuse has mm, shortened. Or maybe you're more patient now. You're more patient with your family or more patient with your neighbors and friends and those you meet. Maybe your understanding of other people, their problems and their struggles and their strains because of what you've gone through or are currently going through. Maybe you're going through the same experience. And now, yeah, you're far more tolerant and far more forgiving than you were. And that is a really good thing. We were all saddened this week, weren't we, to hear the news of Captain Sir Tom having died at the age of 100. And just a year ago, there he was, stirring the nation with his super walk for the NHS, hoping to raise a thousand pounds, and in the end raises a staggering 32 million pounds. <laughs> Astonishingly, he ends up with a number one in the charts, singing, you'll never walk alone with Michael Ball. 
And he is now in the Guinness Book of Records for being the oldest person to have ever had a number one. How amazing is that? Of course, the tributes have poured in. What an achievement. He certainly touched the heart of the nation. He certainly lifted the spirits of those who were downcast, and he's encouraged us all to see that a brighter tomorrow is certainly on the horizon. And we all duly salute him this morning for his valiant effort and his quite remarkable spirit. So, tell me, have you changed? Well, of course you have. We all have. I mean, it, it would be silly for us to presume that we hadn't. <laughs> we know we have. For the good, and if we're honest, for the not so good. What a year. And, and now, with some better news on the horizon, we all immediately want to say, oh, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. <laughs> uh, are you sure? Yes, of course, we all need to be able to see our family and friends again without restrictions. That that's, goes without saying. And we all want to come back together in church, don't we? And you're all shouting at me right now to say, yes! to worship, to sing, to shout, and I'm sure some of you want to wave a flag and share fellowship with one another once again, without screens and without masks and gaps and with plenty of coffee and biscuits afterwards. <laughs> we all want to be able to have some security with regards work. We all want to know that we're able to earn a living, and we all want to know that the NHS staff are not a breaking point. We all want to know that the economy is recovering and that things are on the up. But will they? Are we? Will it ever be the same? The disciples were, no, you can't say it any other way. They were in a state of shock. They were really quite in a daze. The last few days and weeks have been a roller coaster of an experience. One day they're helping Jesus in his ministry. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 tells us one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. One minute they're, they're ministering with Jesus, going out, being sent. Wow. And then later on we read, he, Jesus sends out 72 other disciples, sending them in pairs to towns and places that he planned to visit. You could say they were like a reconnaissance party. Um, they, they were listen to what Jesus has to say to them. Luke chapter 10, verses 2 to 4. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, Jesus said, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now, go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs amongst wolves. Take care, sorry, don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, or nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. They've been on a mission, no doubt. Huh? What a change. I mean, life was never going to be the same for them again, was it? This was going to be a mission that would, well, just, just beyond words. Life never being the same. Yes, it may have seemed exciting on the first day, but no doubt there were challenges they would have to face, there were fears that they'd have to overcome, there were dreads they'd have to get straight in their minds, and days when nothing would seem to go right. Anybody been there recently? Yes, I'm sure. But having sent them out in pairs, they had to come back and tell what had happened. And they came back celebrating about what they had done, things they had seen and heard. Listen to how they reported it. Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it says, When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. <laughs> Life was never going to be the same again. 
And that would mean for all the right reasons. Though some of the changes would undoubtedly bring challenges, undoubtedly bring doubts and fears, and of course, uncertainties, that's what faith is. Stepping out when you're not absolutely clearly knowing exactly what's going to happen next, <laughs> but trusting God. They were going to have to know the hope of their calling. They were going to have to live by faith and they were going to have to walk in love from now on. I know that was a little sneaky of me, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Do you know, just a little aside, this week marks the 11th year of me being here in Sure Hope Church. <laughs> 11 years. Where has the time gone? <laughs> mm. And of course... That was the mantra that I preached for several years and we had as a strap line. The Lord telling me, sure hope church is to know the hope, live by faith and walk in love. <laughs> it's been a challenge, isn't it? You're all shouting at me again. Yes, it's been a change. And it continues to be so and it will always be. Some folks got it. Others thought about it. Some folks didn't want to get it, and some decided to blaze their own trail. It's meant a lot of changes in a relatively short time. But here we are today, carrying the same message of the good news of the gospel, and yet the world has changed. And so we've had to adapt and we've had to change. Who'd have thought that we can meet together separately? What is that about? Meet together separately every Sunday in our homes. And so we've had to do it over the last 12 months. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? So Jesus had spent time with his disciples. He'd walked the roads. They talked in the starlit skies. They'd laughed. They'd cried. They'd learned so much from their master. But were they really truly listening? I don't know. See, when the 12 disciples saw the horrific scenes of the cross, they were in shock. In fact, there's no report that they were all there even. But those that were, when Peter was there, hmm, they never saw that coming. Even though Jesus had warned them many times, it seems that they hadn't really been listening at all. And now, who'd have believed it? Who, it's just blindsided them completely. Jesus is dead. Indeed, dead and buried. They were thinking, it's all over. What's this last three years been all about? Was it all for nothing? So, in fear, they hide themselves away, afraid of the Jewish authorities, who they undoubtedly believed were going to be out looking for them, afraid of what the future might hold, afraid of making a wrong move, afraid. And that's what fear does. It paralyzes you. Then, just three days later, the women come and tell them that Jesus is alive. Are they going to believe this report? Are they going to suddenly remember all that Jesus had taught them and told them over the last few months and particularly over the last week or so? We're told that Jesus appeared to the disciples. He appeared to them to allay all their fears. John 20, verses 19 to 22, it says that Sunday... Even the disciples were meeting behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Who'd like to have been in that room? Huh? <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, I wouldn't have liked to have been in that room before Jesus appeared, but I certainly liked to have been there when he, when he did appear. 
What changed? Well, if we now read into the next chapter of John, we find at least that they are in, well, they're in a better place. They're no longer locked in a room for fear. Something has changed. John chapter 21, the first three verses, tells us Jesus appeared to them again, the disciples, beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two of the disciples. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. <laughs> we'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. So there is some change. At least they're making an effort. But it's an effort that they're making in their own strength. And the result? They catch nothing. There is another great lesson on the way. They don't realize it yet, but this lesson they're about to learn is going to reinforce the whole mission thing that is about to fall into their laps. If we could say the same. <laughs> we need to be able to recognize that we should be saying the same. We don't realize it yet, but the lessons that we've learned over the last 12 months is going to reinforce the whole mission thing that God has challenged us to fulfill. You see, Jesus is now on the shoreline, and he calls out, Guys, have you caught any fish? <laughs> and, uh, uh, who's that? Is that, is that, is that Jesus? Yes, it's Jesus. And, and so they have to shout back, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> even with their experience, even with their expertise, <laughs> even with their great enterprise, um, how much do we call, guys? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> now, that's not a surprise to Jesus, by the way. He, he knows. When we set about doing things in our own, with our own experience and our own enterprise and our own expertise, we will come back with um, nothing. <laughs> True. So Jesus says, verse 6, John 21, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. <laughs> And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. What? <laughs> it's only the other side of the boat. <laughs> Peter would have remembered, we've done this before. <laughs> and there it is, the mission. Jesus had told them three years ago that they would now be fishers of men. The last time this happened, they remembered it well. Today, going back to fishing in their own strength, even with their own experience, their own expertise and their own enterprise, they achieved nothing. I just say again as an aside, it's rarely a good idea to go back. We must press on. But now... Just by hearing Jesus' instructions and being willing to obey and putting their nets on the right side of the boat, then they catch a huge haul of fish. Not only did they have enough for breakfast, they were able to feed the village. <laughs> I was always intrigued. <laughs> it always fascinated me as to why the number of fish have been counted. <laughs> Because John tells us how many fish they caught in the net. Verses 10 and 11 says, Bring some of the fish you've caught, just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. <laughs> and it's always baffled me, 153. 
First of all, who on earth thought of counting them? <laughs> it must be pretty difficult to catch fish because they're, you know, <laughs> they're slippery, they're slimy. They <laughs> I know, I used to go fishing. And, and you know, it's difficult. To, and the, we're talking large fish. And yeah, anyway, they've counted them. They've taken the trouble to count them. And they always, uh, not only have they counted them, but now John feels it's important to even tell us that there were 153. You know, why not 150-ish fish, ish? <laughs> no, 100, specifically 153, precisely. And here's the lesson that introduces our next great promise of Jesus that brings us hope in difficult times. 153 is an interesting number. <sighs> Apparently, I'm led to understand that there were 153 nations in the known world at that time and 153 known species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> oh, so the lesson that the disciples will soon learn is that the, good, the gospel, the good news of the gospel is for all nations, not just for the Jews, indeed for every tribe of every nation, for all people of all backgrounds, of all ethnicity. Indeed, the good news of the gospel is good news for the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Ah, would they understand? I mean, would they, would they understand that rather obscure clue on the seashore when they were eating their breakfast? Probably not. But in just a few days, they soon will. And so we come to Matthew Chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Wow, that's a shock, isn't it? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that changes everything. Here we are at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Remember, he was the tax collector, Levi, the one who everyone hated, <coughs> the one who everyone despised, the one who everybody rejected and, and kept well away from, would have nothing to do with him, the one who, well, they would, they would soon stab him in the back if they had the chance. The one who must have thought the whole world is against me. And now he writes the final chapter of his account and records for all of us to read, for all of us to understand, for all of us to respond to the great promise of Jesus to all of us. In these final verses, Jesus does three things. First of all, Jesus accuse, assures them of his power. These guys had seen a lot. Miracles of healing, they'd heard a lot. Teaching that completely baffled and bamboozled the teachers of the day. But they'd also experienced a lot themselves. Remember, they too had healed the sick, and they too had brought deliverance to those who'd been tormented by demons. And how did they do it? Sorry, mm, you remember? By using the name of Jesus. Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. And now Jesus is reminding them once again, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And of course, who could deny it? They had just seen him die on a cross. They had witnessed that terrible scene. They had heard his final cry, it is finished. 
They had seen the sun stop shining in the middle of the day. They had heard the reports of tombs opening and dead people walking around. I know because I was there. But then that wasn't the end. The, the women were there when the angel appeared and spoke to them. The earthquake, the stone that rolled back from the entrance of the tomb, the empty grave clothes that were folded. And then Jesus calling Mary by name. They too could say, I know, because I was there. Paul tells us that Jesus not only appeared to the women that morning, later on to the disciples, but he also appeared to 500 people all at the same time. Listen to how he puts it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 3. I passed on to you what was also most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. When Jesus said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, he meant it. He was living proof. Then Jesus put them on a mission. <laughs> I wonder what they thought. What? We've just been on a three-year mission. What? Another mission? Really? Jesus? <laughs> and the lesson they learned the other day on the shoreline of Galilee, they're about to be reminded of. This mission isn't just in the local area. It's not just in Judea, and maybe, oh yes, do we have to go through Samaria? <laughs> yes, this they did. No, no, this mission is to the whole world. Go and make disciples of all nations. And they're thinking, what, 11 of us? <laughs> how are we going to do that? <laughs> you saw how frightened we were just a few days ago. We're locked in that little room, remember, huddled together, fighting back the tears, afraid of our own shadows. <laughs> and you want us to go where? <laughs> you want us to go, where on earth do we start? <laughs> exactly, on earth. <laughs> That's where you start. Make a start where you are. But it's not just a mission, it's a commission. <laughs> remember, all authority has been given to Jesus. So he has the right, he has the power, he has the authority to make such a command, such a charge. He was sending them with his authority. <laughs> Again, boys, remember what happened before. You said, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. <laughs> so not only does Jesus have the authority to give such a command, he's giving them his authority his name, to fulfill his command. And of course, the remarkable thing is this. We can look back over the last 2,000 years and see that all the nations of the world have been reached with the gospel. The 11 that started have fulfilled what they were given to do. And they, where did they start? right where they were. Later, when they were baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to Asia and to Africa and Europe and indeed now to the ends of the earth. But now it's our turn. Because all nations have been reached, that's one thing. Making disciples in all the nations. Now, that's something else. Jesus gave us the lesson plan, the how to, the how to make a disciple, baptizing them, teaching them to obey, and then going on to make more disciples. And that's going to mean another change. Who's up for change? <laughs> 
Once we receive the commission of Jesus, once we set ourselves to do what he asks of us to do, then everything in life will indeed change. Nothing will be the same. See, this does not sound familiar. <laughs> We've said it so often in the last few weeks. And now the reality of what that actually means for us as disciples of Jesus. New priorities. Yeah, we need new priorities. We need a new emphasis. We need new challenges, true? We need, uh, do we need new dangers? But there will be new principles, yes, and a whole new way of living. It's called living for Jesus. Hmm. Go and make disciples of all nations. Thirdly, the great promise of Jesus that brings us hope in difficult times is the promise of his presence. He says, go, and you want to shout at me now and say, go where? And I'm going to say, go where you are. You see, loneliness has become such a huge issue over the last 10 years. Not just this last 12 months. Over the last decade, loneliness has become a massive issue. There is a huge, huge thing. There is a, a key that will unlock the loneliness prison cell. Because for me, that's what loneliness is. It's a, it's a prison cell. So many people this last year have been cooped up. In their own minds, they're locked in their homes. Nobody to speak to, nobody to listen to, except the bad news on the TV, no friendly visits, no neighborly checks, not even family able to come for a cuppa, let alone see their children or grandchildren. What a torrid time it's been. But what has already been highlighted by social services is that when people are able to help others, when we are able to get involved, then the stepping out of the prison cell that you feel that you're in breaks the feelings of loneliness for you, the individual, and it also helps to break others out of their prison cell of loneliness. But Jesus is being very specific. He says, when we go, he will be with us. <laughs> so there's something we need to say here. Jesus didn't say, when you feel my presence in great power, when you've had a fabulous service where you sense my presence and, and you know my speaking to you, then, then don't delay, go today. <laughs> he didn't say that. We're not supposed to be waiting to feel anything. We're to go, whether we like it or whether we feel it. The promise is clear. As we go, so he will be with us in our going. And going today doesn't mean that we have to physically travel anywhere. It's so interesting. What, I'm going to ask you a question. What are the two main technical, technological advances in the last hundred years? What are the two things that just... Uh, 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 of all the advances and all the developments and all the things that have changed in the last hundred years, and boy, have they changed, the two things that stand out extra, extraordinarily. First of all, transportation, and secondly, communication. They're the two things that have exploded in technological advances. Let's just think about it. In just over 100 years, we have gone from just about flying 21 miles across the English Channel to being able to fly non-stop to Australia, some 14,000 miles. And of course, we've even been to the moon and back. 
And where do we start with communication? In the last 20 years, we have moved from mobile phones and the novelty of being able to speak to people. And, and there's, no, there's no cables, there's no connection, there's no wires. And you can, you can phone people from your car, and, and not when you're driving, but you, you can be out in your business, and wherever you are, and speak, and uh, wonderful, yeah. And now, in, in less than 20 years, we can see them as well. We can talk live to someone on the other side of the world, and without any cables and connections and wires. <laughs> we can talk to people we don't know. We can play games with people we, we've never seen. We can share news. We can gossip and raise a bunch of money like our dear friend Sir Captain Tom. With people we don't know. All by communicating with people we've never met and are never likely to ever meet. And certainly we don't know. We're never likely to know. Wow. So what's the problem? Jesus said, go. Transportation. Anywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. He tells us to go. Jesus said, teach. Teach them to obey. Communication. On all platforms, on all devices, using all technologies. <laughs> and as we do... Jesus said, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We, well, we may well be nearing the end of the age. And Jesus' return is indeed sooner than we think. But until he does return, guess what? We have a job to do. And in the coming days, Sure Hope Church, you're going to hear about a very exciting project, a mission that we are set to embark on to fulfill the going of the Great Commission. My ask of you all is to be prepared to accept this very simple go. You don't have to travel anywhere. You don't have to save up for a flight, which you can't fly anyway, <laughs> or take a boat ride. You don't have to do any of that. The going is actually just going where you are. But by being involved, that's the going. There's no need to travel, there's no need to enroll in university or get a teaching certificate. The opportunity to go and to make will be made available to specifically meet the very challenging need, the need of loneliness. And Jesus said, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And yes, I'm sorry, I hold my hands up. It will indeed mean change. <laughs> but we're used to that by now, aren't we? Nothing's going to be the same ever again. The great and precious promises of Jesus that bring us hope in difficult times is when we hear the Lord say, Go, and I'll be with you. Lord, help us to have the faith, the courage, and the willingness to obey your command. And we will see your kingdom come. Your will be done in old Colwyn as it is in heaven. I pray that's been a help to you today and an encouragement. And I pray that we will all, in the coming weeks, as we hear more, about what the Lord has given us to do, be ready to go and make disciples <laughs> in the whole of Old Colwyn and the surrounding area. And as we go, Jesus says, I'm with you always. He's not sending us on a goose chase. He's sending us on a mission. 
and he's commissioning us with his power to do it. I pray you're encouraged today. Join with us. Make contact with us. If you want to help or be involved, I'd love to hear from you. But most importantly, know that in your going to do the work of Jesus, he's with you always. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.